they had the, the tools and the wood to do it, but they were in VLNA catalogs and Abercrombie and Fitch catalogs, and they were quite expensive, and only the wealthy people would have a nice wooden tackle box. Well, then, you know, plastic came along and all the other stuff. But I started restoring some old boxes because I didn't want to see them go away and keeping the patina and the original look and all. That was pretty hard to do, but I kind of got it down in a little bit. And then I couldn't find the boxes at a price that I could feel like it was worth me to, 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 to go to all the trouble. And I thought, I can make a better box than this. So I put the all the box joints and all the stuff in them and made them out of our American hardwoods. A lot of the early stuff was made out of mahogany, you know? And uh, it just, guys guys liked them. They, they wanted to buy a few of them. And uh, some of them wanted to buy them and give them as gifts. And uh, I've still got, you know, people approaching me wanting to know if I can make them a special kind or something like that. And so I try to use a lot of different woods. I try to make them all about standard to the original tackle boxes that's out there. And so one day I, I made uh, several boxes for this guy and he says, uh, would you restore this? Florida tackle box for me. And I said, yeah. And he said, can you keep this patina? I said, I think it can. So I give it back to him. And he said, well, that's pretty good. I really like that. Thanks. And he's just proud of it because it was a Florida tackle box. And I thought, you know what? I'm from Florida and I make tackle boxes. So I guess I'm a Florida tackle box maker. So, you know, I'm not a big, some big established company that was cranking them out and putting them in magazines, but I just do them for the friends at the show and stuff like that. So I'm really happy to do that because it gives me something to do and, and I enjoy it because I think it's like a minna bucket. It's like a face trap. It's like a glass minna trap, a tackle box, a stringer. That's all part of it. That's what people remember their grandpa having. That's what people had when they grew up and they fished with their grandpa and they come in here and they relive all that. Retro bassin, kicking some ass and wearing rayon jackets. Thinking about Bill Dance, watching these fish prance through my Ray-Ban glasses. Ain't nothing better than 40 year old lures coming off of Zepco 33. Bass boat making beer cans float, doing some trespassing. Fishing it old school, this old stuff rules. Welcome to Retro Bassing. As a kid, I just always liked collecting and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I was a fisherman and a hunter and a lot of different things, and it just came naturally. And then one day, a guy told me, a guy from Maine, said, Have you ever been to the Florida Antique Tackle Collectors thing. I said, no, I belong to the National Fishing Lure Collectors Club and all that. And so I said, one day they have a show. And he said, oh, they have a big show every year at Daytona. And so I walked in there one day, but uh, the first time I actually went to a show was a national show in, uh, I believe it was Charlotte, North Carolina. And I just couldn't believe what I saw. It was overwhelming. I didn't even know, you know, and I had fishing lures and tackle boxes and stuff, bass fishing and fly fishing and all that, but I never saw anything organized and put together like this stuff is. So, you know, that's just, and, and then I just, it gets in your blood. I think the biggest thing that it does is once you start getting into it and you gain knowledge and then you find other people who has knowledge, it's just like reading a book, you know, and then you find out you didn't know that existed until you read that book. Well, you start hanging around with these guys and they've got so much knowledge in their head and they're collectors, they're not profiteers, you know, they're, they're not, they, they'll sell you, they'll sell you things, and, but, but if you come in this show, you'll feel welcome and you'll feel like you learned something when you walked out here and guys bring their wives and I find the wives find things they like in here too. You know, they like my little Colorado moss or, or they like uh, the tackle boxes or whatever it might be. And they come down through there, oh, I just love the way your display is. So, and then the kids come and you know, and their eyes are about this big and they don't understand it all, but grandpas bring their kids and to get them interested in something that's clean and healthy and you know, kind of you know, have the adjectives to, 
support all that what you might hear but yeah these guys are passionate about it and and they take care of it and actually what they're doing is preserving history and there's a lot of history there's a lot of people that you meet in tackle collecting what i've found out that over the years i've lost some friends because i've been at it so long and you say this guy was vice president of whirlpool you know this guy was a whole head of all this, that, and the other. This guy worked on the space shuttle project. You know, I mean, it's so varied, and this guy's just like you and me sitting here in a t-shirt and a hat on, and, and you know, and you think, hey, he's just an ordinary guy, he's just, just a litter collector, but there's some really, really special people that, that, that do this, you know? And it can be very expensive when you get into <laughs> certain parts of it, so I won't discount that part of it either. But I find one thing, that the new people that are coming and actually showing up to the shows, they're really happy that they came and they're excited about it. And we still get new members every show and everything, but we need to get the word out more so that we get a lot more new members. Because there's, they, one time it's been, oh, probably 10 or 15 years ago, I asked one, Bill Stewart, one of the sages in the in the lure collection business, I said, how much of this stuff you think still out there, Bill? And he says, I think there's more out there than we've found yet. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know about that. Seems like there's an awful lot of lures in here. I used to be known as a, a fly lure collector, which wasn't many of us, because when you know all the bass fishermen and fishermen in the world, the fly fishing community is small. And so uh, I was the fly guy, that's what they called me, and they came to me for information and wanting to know what this was, what that was, and then as we found out how much there was out there, a guy by the name of John Muma had started a book at one time and did a brief version of what things are worth and what they are and identify. And at that time, there was so many things we didn't know anything about. And there wasn't eBay and all these information sources that, that like we have on the internet now that you can learn things pretty quick. So he got with me and several other guys that are very few of us. And we he put together a, a fly, fly lure book. And I'm in the book, you know, and, and a lot of other guys with their names quoted as such. But that's how it got started. But I, I, li I, I like it all. But I just became a fly, and I got one of the biggest fly lure collections in the country, and that I've since sold it off because I, you know, just I had too much, too much. <laughs> and I guess any collector can say that. Too many cars or whatever. I don't know if there's too many, but you know how it goes. You got to thin the, thin the herd a little bit. I had a fly lure collection, a hidden fly lure collection, that probably at, when the market was at its peak was maybe somewhere close to $100,000. Uh, I sold it when it was down because I changed houses and stuff and didn't have room for a lot of stuff. And it probably got half. It's not about the money with these guys though. And most of these guys, they like to go out and go to yard sales, garage sales and pick and look and then they like to trade and early on we were known it was more of a trading show than money passing hands you know but it, it's just like anything it involves you know you, you, I was lo long enough to see the early years of the NBA and what it's what it grew to you know and that's the same way this this hobby has, has been and of course NBA is not a hobby but it's just you know growing into it Magnum proportions, and these guys now we need some new, we need some new members in here to carry on what they've done, and we need some new people to get the interest, interest in all that, and uh, so hopefully, you know, this interview here and talking to you and uh, a lot of these guys, they're always friendly. They'll if you got a question and you've seen something or you know a neighbor that's got something, they'll maybe get in touch with that neighbor. I've had old people come to me and say, I've got all this stuff that belonged to my grandpa. I go, oh, wow, you know, and I want to sell it. Well, these guys don't try to take advantage of them. Most of them that I know don't. They're ethical about it and say, well, what you need to do is bring it to the show. We'll put it in the auction, you know, or I'll, I'll give you so much for it. And if it's a fair price, those people think, you know, that they're happy. And so that's pretty much how it goes. 
Well, I tell you what, I've never marketed my tackle boxes online or anything like that. Uh, I'm really not wanting to get into the tackle box business, but I live I live here in uh, Yalaha, Florida, which is in Central Florida, just a little north of Orlando, and I have a business card, and my name is Gene Meisberger, and uh, you could contact me through this website, you know, the Florida website or your site or whatever, but I live in Yalaha, Florida, and I would be glad to work with somebody that really wanted something because most of these guys take them and give them to these hard to give to people. You know, this grandfather that's retired and was a great fisherman and they want to give him a special gift and stuff like that. And so, you know, those are always a hard kind of people to buy. And of course, there's guys like me, just, I'd buy one for myself, you know. But <laughs> so anyway, that, that's kind of how that goes. And, and I, I, you know, I've had people approach me and they want me to make them a custom box out and then they usually don't know the woods. So I try to show them the different kinds of woods and stuff that I have so they can help pick that out. And, you know, may amount of cedar, they smell good. I've even had women buy them for makeup boxes and jewelry boxes. And I sold one to a gal that was a, wanted to, to make a make it into a makeup box. So I'm going to put it right on my vanity in my bathroom. I sent it to her, and she said, "I said I want two more now." <laughs> you know? Fishing it old school, this old stuff rules. Welcome to Retro Bathroom.